Hey, everybody, welcome to the Gym Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. How's everybody doing today? Hope you guys are doing well. It is Monday. It's the start of a new week. But of course, we're here just about every day for you live on our broadcast network, JMS, which of course is the home to the Gym Masters Show Live. Actually, the home is our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. And if you're there, which of course you are, we would love it if you subscribe to the YouTube channel. That would be fantastic. Give it some of our famous lovity. Give us a thumbs up on this episode. We would love that. A thumbs up like if you enjoy this episode. Leave a comment underneath this episode video on our YouTube channel. And if you haven't subscribed, Boy, that really helps us big time. It also gives you an opportunity when you click the notification bell. That's that little bell icon that you see next to the uh, red word subscribe, that little subscribe bar or button you see there on the YouTube channel. Click that. There's no cost, of course. I don't know why they say subscribe because you, you think there's like a cost involved, you know, like a magazine or something. But no, it's no cost. It's just uh, connecting you with us. And also when you click the notification bell, that allows you to be notified when we have our special guests. We have our pop-up surprise shows, and those are host chat viewer shows where it's you and I chatting about all kinds of things in our lives and uh, cool things that are going on in the world and current events and uh, lots of cool things we talk about. Uh, all kinds of things that are involving every aspect literally of life and Oftentimes, it's those pop-up shows, which everybody loves, are very inspirational, too. And, of course, our guests. With our guests, my celebrity friends and guests who pop on from Broadway and Hollywood, television, film, music, stage, uh, culinary arts, sports, comedy, inspiration, music. Uh, you name it, and it's really cool. We've done some 440 episodes of the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. I giggle because I can't believe it myself that we've done that many shows, but it's really cool. I love doing it. I love engaging with all of you. Thanks for all the Instagram messages, the Facebook posts, the sharing and the tagging of these links to these episodes, continuing to tell everybody about our very special place we've created called JMS Live the Gym Masters Show Live, and we really appreciate that. You guys are amazing. I'm talking about the viewers who uh, watch all the time, whether you watch quietly and you don't comment and you just watch and you enjoy, whether you watch us live or you're watching us later after the show is live, we welcome you. For those who watch live, they love to comment, and you can do that right now. You can comment live during our actual broadcast, which is great. We give you the opportunity to do that. And... Um, they're called the levities. Yes, because in the summer last year, I said light, love, and levity, and I said it too fast, and all of a sudden out came that word, levity, and that was cool because now they're part of our levity squad. The viewers are the levity squad. They call me Mr. Levity. They call this levity hall. I think that's really cool. I love that, and that just happened by trial and error. <laughs> we have an amazing guest tonight we're going to be welcoming in just a second. We're really excited to have him here on the show. I'm sure you know of him, uh, Larry Kerwin, of course, uh, founder of the Celtic rock band uh, Black 47 is with us. He's also the author of a really special book, uh, Rockaway Blue. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But um, if you know Larry's work, of course, then you know uh, who we're talking about. Here's a cool shot I actually love. There he is when uh, with Black 47, and there's another great shot here as well with the gang and another one. That's a cool, really cool shot with Larry and the gang as well. But his book, Rockaway Blue, is a novel, and it's something very special and near and dear to his heart. And we're going to talk about that with Larry uh, in just a minute. So good to have everybody here. Uh, we welcome you guys. We always have our traditional welcome, so we say hi Everyone, thanks for joining us here on the Gym Master Show Live. Hello to all the lovities that are watching all around the world. As I mentioned today on the show, we've got the founder of the Celtic rock band, Black 47, and author of Rockway Blue, Larry Kerwin, is joining us in just a second. You're watching this episode on JMS, uh, of course, the Gym Master's TV channel on YouTube. Give it a thumbs up and uh, leave a comment there. We would love that. That helps us big time. Share the lovely. Tell everybody about the Gym Master Show live. Subscribe to the channel. We would love that. And for those of you who love the uh, Super Chat, Super Emojis, um, Super Stickers feature, that's something brand new that's happening on YouTube for our channel. 
That helps support the channel as well. And we also, when you do that, we super highlight your live comment during the show. And also, I personally thank you for that comment as well. That's something cool. And if you're having a great day, awesome. If you're not, stick with us. As you guys know, this is the place to come to be uplifted, inspired, have a good time, learn something. And uh, we just have a cool time together. Sherry Larson, one of our Lovities watching in Kansas, is with us. Good evening, Jim. Lovities and guests, good to have you with us, Sherry. Always wonderful when you're here. Hi, Dawn. She loves the Master's Mantra post we did earlier today on our YouTube channel. If you didn't see it, we posted a new episode, Season 2, Episode 23 of our Master's Mantra series, which is also on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. We uh, posted this video, Wall of Wow. Check it out. I think you'll like it. Good to see Sherry. Good to see Dawn. Good to see Mary in Florida. Hello, Jim and lovely friends. Nice to see you as well. Alessandra, hello to you in North Carolina. We love that you're here as well. Linda Odell is here. Good evening, Mr. Lovety. Good evening, Lovety. It's good to see you in Florida. That's right, in St. Augustine. And also, Alessandra says she shared this episode on Facebook and Twitter. We love that. Kathleen is in New York City, and the, obviously the... Uh, Mets are not playing at home. She works with the New York Mets during the summertime. So that means the Mets are not playing at home. She's here with us and we love it. Happy to be here this week. Hi everyone from Kathleen Walker, New York City, Ontario, Canada. Merlin is here. Good to see you, Merlin. Welcome to the show, Merlin. And Wozniak is with us. Hello, Jim and lovely family. Hope everyone had a wonderful weekend. Absolutely. It was stunning. Uh, and hope you guys had a good weekend as well. Summer is in full swing here. It's hard to believe that it's the middle of August. Got to count those days and just maximize the remainder of uh, summer, the unofficial summer as well. And um, Merlin says, uh, hello there, Larry. Welcome to Lovety Hall. And Linda says, uh, good evening, Larry. You're a Lovety now. I told him about the Lovety thing here on our show. He said it was uh, a great idea. He loves it. Uh, Joan Sando is here. Good to see you, Joan. Hi, Jim and Lovities in uh, Lovety Hall. <laughs> Good that you are here. We waited. We kept the light on for you as well. And uh, Alessandra is having a good time learning a new language. That's awesome. Uh, you love the new logo. Yes, that's our new logo. Not with the green. <laughs> that's me Irish that is coming out of the head. I'm gonna, we're going to have to play with this light that's bouncing off this led light here it's so bright that's bouncing off the monitor and it's kind of cool it's like it shows the irish in there right uh we're gonna probably do something where that blocks that out but yeah that's the new logo you saw the new open uh actually we have one more tweak that we're doing with the new open we were just sort of slowly rolling it out this week just to, to show you guys but we have one more thing we're doing with that uh, new open which will probably roll out in September. And uh, Christine Clifton is here. Hello, Jim and all lovelies. Welcome Larry to the show this evening as well. Good stuff. You guys are the best. We have the best audience, the best crowd, the best group uh, of fantastic, fantastic viewers. And I, we just think that you guys are absolutely the best and, and we love you all. As I mentioned He's with us tonight, live from New York City, and we're so excited to have him here. Um, you know, if you know the music, like I said, then you know what I'm talking about. The book, first let me tell you just a little bit about the book. We will be talking about it. Um, of course, we know that uh, the anniversary of 9-11 is coming up, and when terrorists attacked on September 11, 2001, Lieutenant Brian Murphy rescued seven people from the World Trade Center, even as still... Uh, girders buckled and groaned. Brian rushed up, back up those stairs of the North Tower in search of those in need. He died a hero, one of the more than 400 police officers, firefighters, and other first responders who perished that fateful day. Three years later, a Vietnam veteran and retired NYPD detective, Sergeant Jimmy Murphy, is on a mission to find the truth behind his son's death. Why was Brian in the tower that morning? Had he anticipated the attack, suspecting a cover-up, suspecting a cover-up for a deeper truth, Jimmy must confront his family, friends, and old colleagues in the police department to discover what happened to Brian and who his eldest son really was. Uh, that's just a little snippet of the book. Uh, there's so much more to, to share with you as far as what the book is about. Larry himself was the leader of the New York-based Irish political rock band, 
Black 47 for 25 years. He's actually the author of five previous books as well and 17 plays and musicals. Did you know that? Including Paradise Square, which will open on Broadway in 2022. Yep. He's also currently working on a stage version of The Informer. He also hosts Celtic Crush, a popular radio show on Sirius XM. Did you know that? Yep. Writes a column for the Irish Echo as well, and much, much more. So as I mentioned, uh, he's uh, a busy guy and uh, celebrating uh, life, celebrating the heritage, and so much more. And he's live in New York City. Let's welcome Larry Curran to the show. Larry, welcome to the Jim Master Show Live, my friend. It's great to have you here. Jim, it's a pleasure to be with you and, and with the Lovities. And with the Lovities. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm a guest Lovity now. You're a guest Lovity. It's a cool thing to be, isn't it? I tell you. I just wish I was a little lovelier, but what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> a nothing lovelier Lovity. <laughs> nothing a little Baileys can't take care of. <laughs> then everybody's a Lovity. Uh, Anne is in Jacksonville, Florida. She says, hi, Larry. Looking forward to interesting conversation tonight. Great music. Awesome. And that's Anne in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Alessandra, North Carolina. Welcome to Lovity Hall, Larry. And uh, Anne is watching in Southern California. She's uh, saying hello. She's glad to be joining us live as well. Good to see you, Anne, in Southern California. Uh, Alessandra says you're now part of the Lovity family as well, which is very cool. Man. So you've been inducted already, which is cool. Uh, Kathleen Walker in New York says, hi, Larry, and welcome. Mary in Florida says, hello, Larry, and welcome. Dawn says, hi, Larry, welcome here with us. Um, and it, it looks like you're having a brilliant idea, she says. I like that. We're always having a brilliant idea. And Linda says, because you, Mr. Loverty, are the very best host. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. As my father has always said, whenever anybody says something kind or nice, ask them to please put it in writing and address it management. <laughs> that's, that's my uh, father's Irish humor. Uh, Christine Clifton says, hello, Jim and all loveties. Welcome Larry to the show this evening. So uh, getting a little bit of official lovety wave there. She also says, Larry, welcome to the show tonight. Lovety Holy and now a lovety. Happy you could join us. And uh, that's really cool. And Anne says, welcome, Larry. So good to see you there, my friend. How have you been? And uh, obviously, you know, we've, we've gone through some really interesting times uh, in the last several months or so, year or so. How have you been? How have you kept creative, collaborative, sane, connected through all this? And the sane part, and when I ask that, everybody says, I don't. I'm not really there yet on the same part yet, Jim. Get back to me later. <laughs> well, you know, it, although the pandemic was an awful thing and whatever, my life didn't change a whole lot because um, I'm a writer. You know, I write books and I write musicals and write plays and uh, I write a column for the Irish Echo. So, I just continued what I was doing, and uh, it was a it was a good time creative wise. For one thing, I had been working on this book pretty much over the last twenty years, and many times I dropped it, of course. But I was able to finish it in the first six months of the pandemic, and uh, that was a great feeling because it was something that had been on my mind since the the very morning of the attack. If you see that window behind me, uh, you could see the, the, the trade towers from there. Um, so I'm pretty close to it. And I was actually sitting in this, I just realized I was sitting in this exact position. And I think it's Kathleen who works for the Mets. Well, uh, I'm a, a big Mets fan and I was reading the scores or the, uh, the, the standings at the time, I, I was a big fan of of them. And that plane came over so low, uh, I actually slammed my head down on, the, on the, the paper and on the table because I thought it was coming through the, through the walls. And then, of course, it didn't. It passed over. And then seconds later, there was just this thump. It wasn't like the sound uh, in... 
the movies of an airplane crashing. It was more like uh, someone hitting the concrete with a big sledgehammer. And then I, I ran up on the roof and uh, there was the most amazing and horrific sight it was this huge plane embedded in the North Tower. So I actually went down because uh, at that point you could move around. Uh, I went down about eight blocks and the smoke and the dust were just so thick at that point. I figured this is not safe. And I turned around and came back. Uh, so I've been in many ways writing the book since then, but the real emphasis of it and the real inspiration came the first night after when Black 47 played. Uh, Black 47 was known as the house band of New York City. So when we weren't on tour, we always had a place to play in. Uh, now, nobody was in the city or coming out at that point. So we figured we have to get people back into Midtown. So we had a, um, a residency in a place called Connolly's on 45th Street, just about mm -hmm. Times Square. And we put out the word that we were coming in the, the following Saturday and people, please come back into the city. And of course, a lot of the fans did. But even more so, the word got out amongst the first responders who were down in the pit, as we called it, you know, trying to rescue people and uh, trying to um, clean up in various ways. And so the place was jammed on the first night. And then a phenomenon I just noticed for the first time, whenever the door would open, everybody would turn around because you see at that point we didn't know who was alive and who was dead yeah and it was amongst black 47 fans who were pretty close and um, we had a a cop in the band chris Byrne was one of the co-founders so we always had a huge um police and fire uh support so when, when the door would open, everybody would turn around and say, oh, Johnny made it, or Mary made it, and everybody would run over, and it was such a relief that someone was alive that you knew. Uh, and after that happened maybe about 10 or 12 times, I began to think, but what about Billy or Michelle who are not going to make it? Uh, so there's, there's two edges to this sword. And at that point, I think, was when the idea for Rockaway Blue was born, was, you know, to tell the story of 9-11 through the eyes of the regular people, not through the politicians who were co-opting co it already and would eventually take us to war in Iraq over it, but to tell the story through the eyes of the ordinary people because I knew they were going to get forgotten. Uh, and I felt it was really important that their story should be told. That's beautiful. I mean, really, uh, what was that writing process like for you? Uh, I'm sure it was very, you know, cathartic, therapeutic, but it could be emotional. I mean, these stories are still raw. The, the thought of it is still we're coming up on the anniversary now, too. But um, what was that writing process like for you, Larry? Well, it was really intense, but it, I'll just explain to you how it, it took so long to do it. Um, I write pretty much every day. I've always believed that someone said to him once that if you're a writer, Make sure you write every day because it's like an old pump, you know, that used to be on farms, that if you, if you use the pump every day, then the water is clear. If you don't use it for days or a week, then rust comes out first. So yeah. the idea in writing every day is that you're not rusty, that it, there's a flow. Uh, but for the, for the year after 9-11, because Black 47 was so identified with New York, uh, I didn't write. It was the strangest thing, because we were, we were very busy, but you know, I'm busy all the time, and I'm able to write, but I didn't write for the first year. And uh, a year, the first anniversary of 9-11, I, um, I could feel it building, something mm. building inside me, and I realized I'd never stopped to really think 
too much about it or to accept whatever pain was coming in. And we lost a lot of uh, friends in that. And then it struck me that it's actually starting to happen to me on the, the first anniversary. And I went around to a lot of churches and prayer halls and everything. And when I was in the Quaker one over on 15th Street, I got this idea, you, you, gotta, you gotta write a Black 47 album about this. And so that was the first thing I was doing commemorating the people and it was called New York Town. So I said it three years before and three years after. So that time span, what it was like in the, uh, before what New York was like before 9-11 and what it was like afterwards. And people liked the album and everything, but it still didn't, I still didn't get the thing of the um, telling the regular people's story uh, so I thought, because I'm a playwright, I'll, I'll do it as a play. And I wrote this play. It took me a couple of years. It was called uh, The Heart Has a Mind of Its Own. And uh, we produced it. It was put on. And people liked it. But on the first night, as people were cheering for it and everything, I realized I, don't, I didn't get it. I didn't get them right, you know? And it was a huge disappointment to me personally, even though people liked it and everything. So I what was it about it? The people liked it, but what? how is it not complete for you inside you? If the, if the folks at large liked it and they were responding, what was it that, that wasn't clicking for you that you were feeling? I didn't feel I had got the main characters of the play, especially... Detective Sergeant Jimmy Murphy, the, the father, and his wife, Maggie, I just didn't feel like I had, uh, I got them truthfully. Like when, when you're writing a, a play, if anything in it is not truthful, you, maybe the people don't get it, but you get it like a stab wound. It's like, yeah. I've, I've spent two years on this and I couldn't yeah. get them right. And I also didn't think that I had painted uh, a clear enough picture of Brian, the son who died, because a lot depended on the fact that you were never going to see him in a play, but you were going to hear about him. And I didn't feel like as I was watching the play that I was getting that clear a picture of him. I did feel while I was writing it that I was getting it, but I didn't feel that. So I put it aside and it took me about four years after that to realize what was missing. You know, when something is up on stage, you all you have are the actors who are personifying the characters, but you're not hearing what's going on inside the characters' heads. And that was what was missing. For me to tell the story of the regular people of New York, I had to be able to show what Detective Sergeant Jimmy Murphy, who had been to Vietnam, what he was thinking. Uh, his marriage wasn't in good shape after the um, after losing the son. the The couple began to to drift apart through the- Did this require a lot of extra research and speaking with family and others to, to gain all of this information? No, I knew it had to be coming from inside myself because, you know, I've always been an observer and if, if you're spending two hours a night on stage uh, while you're getting into the characters and the songs, there's still a lot of time when you're actually observing people People think that they're the ones observing you, and they are, but you're seeing them too. So it gives you um, a good idea of what people are about. But then remember I said that Chris Byrne, uh, one of the co-founders of the band, he was a cop, a detective sergeant also, and lots of his friends would come in. So. For the first time, I was really spending a lot of time with, uh, with policemen and with firemen because where one group goes, the other group tends to show up also. Oh, yeah. 
even though there's a lot of rivalry between them. But I knew so many of them uh, that to get the to get them to get them down on a page just took you know inspiration but even more so perspiration you know to to really hone in on the character and as i was saying to make sure that the characters are truthful so i didn't really need to go and talk to anyone because you know i, I lived up the street from the uh from the towers so I was here when it happened and, you know, I lost two good friends in it, uh, Father Michael Judge and a, um, a fireman called Richie Muldowney, who I, I dedicated the book to. And uh, knowing that they had died during it uh, kind of gives you that uh, link it's almost like a mystical link with it. You know, it, it never, it was never a problem to sit down in front of the computer and, and link up with the characters I'd written, probably because I knew so many people who had died down there. Um, so that's the short answer, answer to that. But it, then it took me a long time to, to write Rockaway Blue, and I put it away a number of times. Uh, How'd you come up with the title? Well, that was that was late late in the book. Um, I, I tried different titles beforehand. Uh, one from uh, a William Butler Yeats poem, a line from it called "A Raving Autumn," because it happened during the autumn. But yeah, on a beautiful crisp September day. Yeah, a day kind of like today was, which was beautiful yeah. and bright and nice. Yeah. And the weird thing is, especially if you live around here and you step out on the street and it is one of those days, it's like it comes back to you straight away. You know, it's yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you hear a weird account car backfire or some weird sound, right? Yeah. Uh, for, for years after a plane passing over would, uh, would be enough to, yeah, would set it off. Yeah. You know? So like when you, so. You're not that far. Did you have to leave the area, evacuate because of all the dusts and all everything that was all over the region and the southern tip of Manhattan? We were lucky or unlucky. Uh, you never know. Um, because Canal Street was the cutoff area, and I'm half a block up from Canal Street. So if I'd been half a block south, we would have had to evacuate. But... Um, I wasn't, but at the same time, if you look back at that window again, uh, usually back then we didn't really have an air conditioner here. So you always had the window open with a, um, with a screen across it. And for about a year after you just couldn't have air from outside coming in for one thing, it was just the weirdest smell off it. Um, and once it got into the apartment, it stayed. It was. It took took a while to get rid of it. So after about six months or so, the smell wasn't always there. Um, but so you would open the window up, saying, "At last, I can get some fresh air in here." You know, right? And yeah. And it would hit you again. You know, it might it might it might be an hour before it would happen, but the, the wind would blow in a different direction. And uh, were the thoughts of leaving the city? No, I felt a real loyalty to the city to stay. You know, we were the house band. We were going to be playing here. And then what we tried to do is, and we were lucky because we had that cachet of being a well known band and everything. So we could play anywhere we liked. And owners of clubs and bars would ask us to play to get people to go out again because people didn't go out for quite a long time you know even when i think back it's almost 20 years now i have to sometimes really hone back into it you know that Times square used to be deserted you know? yeah yeah and you could walk across. I remember one night walking diagonally all the way from 42nd Street up to maybe, well, Connolly's is on 45th, walking mm -hmm. up 
from 42nd to 45th diagonally across Times Square and no cars running. It felt like being in one of the cowboy movies, you know, where yeah. the, the sagebrush is coming down. Yeah, exactly. And then when you got into the place you were playing, it was just such a relief to see people because you think, did am I the only one who didn't know you're not supposed to come out tonight <laughs> or something like that? Exactly. You know, it, how did the group come together for those who may are, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of fans watching, but for those who are finding out about it, maybe for the first time, even though you've been around all these years, how did uh, Black 47 initially come together as you as a founder? What was your vision? What was your hope? Uh, what did you want to bring to the table that maybe really wasn't out there? Well, I had been in a band before that called uh, Major Thinkers, and we had um, a record deal with um, Epic Portrait, with CBS Records. And we were kind of the next big thing around New York for a while, and we had a, a kind of a hit called Avenue B is the place to be. And then we, we got dropped. And I had been a musician most of my life at this point, uh, but I had always wanted to be a playwright and that was in 1985. So the day after we finished, I started to write and started to direct and produce and put on plays. And that happened for lasted for about four years. But I found I was becoming quieter and more um, introspective. Know, yeah, totally introspective and getting in, getting totally into the characters and everything. And I was here one night on my own, and uh, I thought I gotta, I gotta go to a bar. I gotta, I gotta hear some Irish voices. From one thing, yeah, yeah. because I had lived on the Lower East Side for a long time, and there were, weren't many Irish people there. But I had this yearning, and uh, there was a, a bar called Eamon Duran's, which was way uptown by 58th Street. And I thought I'll walk all the way up there. And I, I know Eamon, he's got an Irish accent. And <laughs> uh, but as I was passing this bar called Paddy Riley's on 28th Street and 2nd Avenue, I heard music coming out of it. I thought, well, let me stop and take a look in here. And there was a really good band on called Beyond the Pale. And I'd read about them. And uh, the leader of it, Chris Byrne, recognized me from the major thinkers and uh, I hadn't played really in four years. And he said, uh, we have someone special here who's gonna come up and sing a song for some I'm thinking, no, no, man. I don't even know if I can play the guitar right anymore. And uh, the bartender said, I know what you need. And she gave me a shot of uh, whiskey. And I thought I gotta get up and I got up and I enjoyed myself so much. I stayed, <laughs> playing, I stayed playing with them all night. And at the end of the night, I could tell I was drinking with Chris at the bar and everyone else had gone from the band. I could tell he was kind of depressed. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, well, that's the last night of Beyond the Pale. We're breaking up tonight and I have all these gigs to do and I got a family to support. He was a cop also. And, you know, I don't have a band. And I said, well, I'll do it with you. <laughs> he said, well, what would we call it? And I said, there's only one name. Uh, has to be Black 47. I'd known that name so much. My grandfather, who had raised me, was this old gentleman who was totally into history. And Black 47 comes from the year 1847, which is the worst year of the Irish potato famine or hunger yes. yeah. war, as we call it, the great hunger. And uh, Chris was very political, Chris Byrne, and I was very political. So Did that your family hail from Northern Ireland? No, I was in the exact Southeast corner. Southeast corner. Uh, in a place called Wexford. Oh, Wexford, sure, yeah. Yeah, but I knew Northern Ireland, or as we call it over the, the north of Ireland, if you're of a Republican-minded way of looking at it. I had been up there. I, I had um, relatives on the Donegal Derry border. So, you know, I knew the score up there. And uh, so the band was going to be political. And while we were at the bar that night, and then we stayed there pretty much all night uh, till the dawn, we came up with a, a game plan, which would be that we would write 
songs about politics, but have them be modern. And uh, Chris, apart from being a great Illin pipe player, was a Brooklyn rapper too, mm. and a policeman. <laughs> and a police. <laughs> so he had all bases covered. He had pretty much all the bases covered, and I was a guitar player, and I could, I could program drum machines, and and I also knew how to write songs from from my previous career. So I went home and. The next gig was a Friday night and I got out all the songs that I thought we could do because we were resolved to do original songs, all original songs as quickly as possible. But the gigs were all up in the Bronx and you had to do four sets. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so it was at this point, it was a matter of like, how do we even survive? You know, what songs do you know? I'll join in with yours and yeah. you join in with mine. So. Merlin in Ontario, Canada is asking, what was the genre? She goes, is it punk? Is it rock? Is it Celtic mix? Well, or... it was it was a mixture of all. Mixture, right. Because I had come from a punk background playing in CBGBs, and Chris had come from a traditional Irish background, but he was also a rapper. So, And we both loved reggae. Uh, so... It was punk, funk, reggae, traditional. It was whatever suited the song. And it would always have a beat and a drive to it. So it was all those things. But it was basically whatever the song called for. And some of the songs were very political and some were personal, you know, but, you know, and some were funny, you know, we, yeah, yeah. Both Chris and I had a really good sense of humor. But then uh, <laughs> we went up to the Bronx and we started to play and everyone hated us. I mean, did they? They absolutely hated it because they only wanted to hear, you know, songs that they recognized. They also didn't want a band coming into your face like the way we would be in CBGBs. You know, in yeah, CBGBs, yeah. it was an attack off the stage. Uh, and we were loud and we weren't that good. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, we, we had, I think we had two. And you're hearing this live and direct from the founder. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't get any more truthful from it than from the yeah. founder. <laughs> and you know, we didn't know the songs that well either. So, but were you, you having know. fun doing it? Is that what it was? And the audiences were having fun and it was, you know, no, the, audiences, and the audiences weren't having they fun. Were. <laughs> and after a while we weren't having fun when you look at when you look like, at people like, 25 years of it huh oh well, that, this, i'm talking about the first month or two the first, first months. iteration of it yeah so we got fired from every place but there, really? had, there had been a boom in construction working and every irish construction worker wanted to own a bar so there was all these bars up around an area called uh, Bainbridge Avenue and 204th Street in the Bronx. Yeah. And there was maybe 30 bars in that region. So as you got fired out of one, you go to the next door. Yeah, another. <laughs> and by the time you, because a recession had set in at this point too, uh, by the time we got back to the original bar, the owners had sold and got someone new in. But the Bronx was an amazing place because uh, people wanted live music. People wouldn't go into a bar without live music. And even though they didn't like us at first, then we began to gather people that did like us. And then we were playing in Queens and Brooklyn too. So then we got invited back to play a regular night in Patty Riley's. This is about three months later. They're so well-known New York uh, hangouts for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we all the places it. that you end up going to after you, which I did March in the St. Patrick's day parade, <laughs> you go from all these names, you end up going there all in the same night. <laughs> yeah. And Riley's was doing badly at the time. So they needed someone to come in and we told them we'd fill the place, but we didn't know we would, but what happened is maybe the, the 30 people in the Bronx, the 30 people in Queens, and 30 people in Brooklyn, along with people from Manhattan, showed up the first night we played. And so the place was jammed. And uh, 
after a while, um, people began to notice that there were lines around to come and see us. Yeah. So Newsday, uh, Newsday, the editor of Newsday happened to pass by one night and he came in and he, he sees this scene going and he assigned uh, a, a writer who still works for Newsday. He was a music writer at that point. He's the movie writer now, John Anderson. And he followed us around for three days and did a huge article on us with pictures. How this band is, you know, is the toast of New York City, but no, no one in the newspapers know about it. It was kind of like the um, Paddy Riley's was our cavern, like with the Beatles. Yeah. So a, whole, a whole scene going on, like when Brian Epstein went into the cavern first, he went there because someone said there was a band filling the place, but he didn't know who they were or what they were. So all of a sudden, we became this celebrity band that everybody wanted to see. So, you know, Liam Neeson will be there, mm. Matt Dillon that type of people yeah, sure. who are all showing up. And then, of course, they drew more people, too. And Joe Strummer of The Clash showed up, and he became a big pusher of the band. And uh, and then it just it just took off big time. But mm. by, by then, we'd gotten a lot better. And the, <clears throat> the people who joined the band joined, though, by very organically. The I had been playing in improv bands downtown where you went on stage with the band and you you made it up as you went along. Um, so the trombone player from that band heard that I had started another band and he just assumed it was a uh, an improv band. So he showed up one night. He didn't even say hello to Chris. <laughs> he just took, <laughs> he that, just took it and just went warm. with it started playing and that was amazing because <laughs> here you, you had the Irish Illin pipes and um, a New Orleans style trombonist playing against each other. And I was thinking, wow, I have never heard a sound like this myself. Yeah. And then the sax player from uh, Dexy's Midnight Runners, his wife was, um, was a friend of mine. And she said, you know, Jeff has left the band. He's over here. And he's going nuts in the apartment. Uh, I said, send him up to Riley's. And so Jeff came up and he said, well, what do I play like? He's an English guy. Yeah. I don't know, man. <laughs> Just get in there and start <laughs> jamming. And uh, he started doing that. And then the drummer had been in my old band, Major Thinkers. And he, we didn't have room for a drummer. And besides, we had a drum machine. But he brought in... He had, he had become really interested in African percussion. So he yeah. brought in djembe and all the shakers and everything. So it, it was a wild sounding band, you know. Uh, people, to this day, people say, well, what was the music like? Like your uh, lovety, right. uh, what yeah. was it like? And yeah. I, I still couldn't really uh, put my hey. finger on it. People call it Celtic rock, but it wasn't, it was, so many, it was kind of like taking Irish music <clears throat> and putting it through the shades of New York City, all the different influences, Miles Davis, Bob Dylan, uh, you know, the hardcore bands from CBGBs, the punk bands, and and then we were political on top of it. So uh, it was a hard one to nail down what it was. So it was there was something really for everybody. Whatever their vibe was, whatever they were coming to see, they would get different elements based on what is whatever they were pulling from it. I guess too, huh? Yeah, and it was passion. A lot of passion. <clears throat> yeah, we were really passionate. It exploded out at you, and um, what I didn't realize at first. Um, I was the main writer in the band, uh, Chris Rock too. But what my writing had changed in the four years that I had become a playwright. Um, and I didn't, I didn't notice it. Um, but when reviewers started to talk about us, they were saying, these songs are all character based and they tell a story. And um, so people were coming for that too, for the, 
this new kind of style. It wasn't, it was actually telling stories through songs and each song had a story and had a hero and had a, a heroine and, um, you know, had a, often had protagonists and enemies in it too. So people were coming and I began to string some of these songs together using the same characters in them and uh, people like that. But I was also re, and Chris too, uh, we were reintroducing Irish Americans to their, their roots. Their roots. And particularly their political roots. So when we started playing Irish festivals, which was pretty soon, we found we were getting three generation audiences. Yeah. We were getting the kids who wanted to, to get up and mosh to the songs. We were getting the people, uh, their parents, and then we were getting their grandparents who could come along because they knew, you know, the names of people like Michael Collins, we did, we did songs about our Bobby Sands or James Connolly. They came along to hear those. They would be way in the back because they didn't want the full blast of the sound, but they could hear the voice in the back and follow the stories that way. So we were an intergenerational band, which, which I always found great. You know, that I remember Jerry Adams, the um, leader of Sinn Fein, coming up to me once saying, you know, uh, my son and I, and we bond over your album, Fire of mm. Freedom, because his son was a teenager and was rebellious, which is kind of funny, being really? rebellious to Jerry Adams. <laughs> 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 but he said, how we bond is we put on Fire of Freedom and we sing to it and we talk about it and talk about the characters. And that came up so many times with other less well-known people that parents were able to bond with their kids to Black 47's music. That's amazing when you hear that, huh? Yeah, I, I was thrilled by it. I, I didn't catch it at first. You know? Right, right. I mean, was it something that you were you hoped would be the result of it all? Was that in the thinking or that's just no. part, that's the icing <laughs> on the cake for it all, huh? I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't even know I was writing character songs because you see, Chris and I, we'd made this vow. We were gonna just do original music, all original music as quickly as possible. Now we had to do four one hour sets in the Bronx when we started. And uh, we finally got down to, that down to four 40 minute sets. But, you know, that took a lot of material. So. It was, so I was writing like crazy in the first couple of years. You know, I would write a couple of songs every week. And we, Black 47 never rehearsed because we always felt a night rehearsing is a night that you could be out getting paid for playing. And we were very, we, a lot of us had young families yeah. and we were very aware that we, play you pay you know you need to uh, right gotta bring the dough in right bills to pay. yeah, it was, yeah. it was a working class band in that sense you know that you got to get paid for it and i think that really helped too um but another thing that came out of the not rehearsing is i would write the songs and bring in a rough idea of what the song was and play to the guys right before we went on stage. And if we were doing a sound check, we would run it through once. And our goal was to get from A to Z in the song. I don't care what mistakes you make, because I'll be making them too. Because right. I got to play the chords and I got to remember the words, which I wasn't going to be able to, because it was, it, was, it was all new material. But we found that if you did that once in front of a crowd, the song came together. Now you could, you could spend hours in a rehearsal studio trying to get everything right. But when you put the fear of God of a crowd watching you yeah. do a song that you don't know, and you're going to, you're going to have to look at them in a way is I didn't make a mistake there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a jazz player, man. <laughs>
Uh, so <laughs> we, we would just keep going the, the, and finish with a big bang, you know, and it'll be probably not one clapper in the after. And you say, well, I got through it. That's the main thing. <laughs> Tomorrow night, it's going to sound better. Tomorrow you know? night's going to be real. We're going to knock it out of the park tomorrow night. Yeah. And, <laughs> and three nights on, you're going to really know it pretty well. But I, I noticed with Black 47 that <clears throat> I never listened to the albums we made because usually the song would have moved on from the album version. Now, sometimes we missed certain things that it would have been good to keep part of the arrangement uh, that would be in the uh, recorded version. But the way we looked at it is the songs were living and breathing themselves and they were right. leading, leading you places. And then all the guys in Black 47 were really good players, but also they were fearless and they were improvers. You know, they all came from an improv background. So, and, you know, you could say they're bullshit artists, too, because they could make a mistake and look at you as if I meant that, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was part of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you might think that we all hit a wrong chord at that point, but, you know, Miles Davis did that, too, sometimes. <laughs> or that's what we tell them at the bar after. You know? Yeah. Who were some of your influences coming up? Who were some of those artists out there that you really admired and inspired you, Larry? Oh, I was inspired by everyone because I came from this little town called Wexford. It was a very musical town. It had an opera festival uh, and a lot of bands in it. It was only about 12,000 people when I was growing up in it. But it seemed like everyone had something to do with music. But listening to the radio, it all seemed like magic to me, you know, that when I heard the Beatles for the first time, it was like, wow, these guys are really something. How could you ever manage to play or write a song like that? So it was all mystical to me. So pretty much everyone I heard on the radio, I was a little bit influenced by. I mean, it was definitely the Beatles and Dylan, Bob Dylan especially, because he had a way with words and I knew I had that a certain facility with words. And I, I didn't copy him in any way, but I, I realized what he was doing. He was letting a lot of uh, word associations happen. And, and then I was really into James Joyce, the writer. Yeah. And what you learn from Joyce is it's not just the meaning of the word, but the sound of the word mm -hmm. is really important too. Right. So I began to incorporate things like that in. I realized that that's what Dylan was doing. He might not have known it, but you know that was everyone was kind of in, uh, you know got an influence from James Joyce at some point. But then there was all the great African-American music. It was like listening to Otis Redding was like, mm -hmm. oh, my God, mm -hmm. how can this guy do this? You know, and right. Curtis Field, people like that with the high falsetto voice. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to be like those guys. I just didn't have their uh, tools. But from listening to them, I learned how to, I learned their phrasing. That was really important. Uh, not that you were co-opting their stuff, but these guys were geniuses at what they did, I reckon. So to listen to them and see how they swoop their voices at times and how they, um, you know, how they stretch notes. And you can learn so much just by listening and then trying it out and sounding ridiculous and sounding awful but then the more you do it the more you uh you use your own chops to uh when singing something like otis would do and you you educate yourself and your own sound becomes that much more your voice mm -hmm. So finding your voice in anything, 
whether it's in singing or in writing or any creative, um, like in painting, whatever it is, uh, that was, that took me a long time to realize that finding your voice is the most important thing that once you've found it. And then, you know, I got really interested in Miles Davis. I probably mentioned mm, that. Yeah. And I read something that Miles said at one point. Uh, he said that I can go to, I could go to any museum and look at a painting on the wall and get totally lost into it and get totally lost into what the painter is trying to, to do. He said, but as soon as I found my own voice, then I, I had it. I had something and I could look at the painting and see how I would rearrange everything to make it seem like something that I was doing. So yeah. Finding sure. voice, make it your own sort of right. Exactly. Yeah. Finding well, your voice is the most important thing in any kind of artistic endeavor. Yeah. And, and in life. Yeah. Generally. In life, sure, and, yeah. In, and in life. Uh, I mentioned a couple of other, you know, prominent things in your world. Author of five previous books. <laughs> Some people might not realize that. 17 plays and musicals, including Paradise Square, which will be opening on Broadway in 2022. Congratulations. Tell us about that one. Well, it began as a musical about the five points, which funny, I keep pointing to this window, but if you, <laughs> if you look at the window and you... If you were to go out the window and make a left turn, there's an area over there called the Five Points. It's gone now, but in the 19th century, it was the greatest slum in the world or the most dangerous slum in the world. And uh, I had heard of it through my grandfather, who I mentioned, who raised me. And he talked about the Irish people going there and kind of disappearing into it. So when I came to New York, I was living on the Lower East Side in you know, Alphabet City. And then I found out that, man, I'm really close to the, the five points. So I used to go down there and try and visualize what it was like. You know, it's a court, the courts area now and Chinatown that makes up the five points. But there were certain of the streets uh, that were still there. I mean, the houses had changed and everything, but I knew where the dance halls were. And what happened was in the Five Points, um, when the Irish came after the famine years or during the famine years from 1847 to 1852, uh, they poured into New York City and many of them made straight for the Five Points because it was the cheapest place to live. And Another group that lived in the Five Points at that point, at that time were free African Americans. And they helped the Irish. Yeah. And they, they had their own dance halls uh, that where they invited people into. And they invited the Irish in. So the Irish and the African Americans amalgamated from 1845 to 1863. And I'll tell you how it ended as we go on. But uh, they amalgamated, many of them married and had children, but even more so they amalgamated their cultures. The Irish had brought over Irish step dancing, right? and the African-Americans did what they called the Juba because they had a great dancer called Master Juba. And they would have competitions. Who is the best Irish dancer and who is the best African-American dancer? And they would have huge competitions and people would bet on who was gonna win it. And that 
through that amalgamation of the Irish step dancing and the Juba dancing, they came up with tap dancing. That's yeah. where it originated. But also they came up with styles of music. Um, so I was very lucky at one point, I used to go to the Strand bookstore and I found a book one time uh, that was about um, the history of lower Manhattan in the 19th century. And lo and behold, there were etchings of the um, African-American dance hall so I could actually see what was going on. And first of all, I was just really interested in the music, being a musician. So I, um, I concentrated on the look of the bands and it was always the same. There would be two Irish people, two African-Americans. It would be an Irish fiddle player, an Irish singer, an African-American percussionist, and an African-American banjo player. And I tried to visualize what would they, what kind of music were they playing? And I could tell by looking at the dancers that they were dancing to jigs some of the times. And uh, I visualized that they were probably playing Irish jigs and that the African-Americans were really good improvers. So they were playing off the Irish people. And then the Irish singer was singing. And I was thinking, what could they, what would these people have known? And the music, I realized that the most famous songwriter in America at that point, and who actually lived in the Five Points, was Stephen Foster. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Foster attended, went to these dance halls because he was stunned by this new music. <clears throat> he had kind of broken away from minstrel music and from American parlor music. And he was taking in the music of the immigrants, the German, Irish, English, Italian immigrants that were mixing with the African-American music of the Five Points. <clears throat> so I put all that together and created a saloon with a black woman who owned it whose husband had gone off to fight in the Civil War and got killed in the Civil War. And her uh, battle to keep the place open. And then we, um, that ran a couple of times at the cell, uh, a theater on 23rd Street. And the word got out about it through a man called Peter Ladon, and he put me in touch with a very famous producer called Gar Trubinsky. And the two of them set out to turn this very small thing into a Broadway show. Mm -hmm. And we started in 2013, I think it was. And God, it'll be, it'll be 222, so it'll be nine years in the making. Um, they was it supposed to happen earlier and did COVID get in the way or was 2022 always the game plan? No, COVID definitely got in the way. It had a successful run at Berkeley Rep on the West Coast. Uh, but before that, they brought in uh, some amazing people. They brought in the choreographer, Bill T. Jones, uh, who's just amazing to work with and to just transform this whole thing because it's supposed to take place in a dance hall and a saloon. And he mixed up the Irish and the Juba dancing with a young cast of dancers and you know, challenged everyone to come up with something that would be, remind you of what happened back in 1863, but that could look great now also. And then we got um, a great director, Moises Kaufman, who had had a, a number of um, great hits and uh, 
really moving pieces. And um, Jason Howland came in to do a lot of the music and uh, Nathan, um, uh, his name just has just escaped me for a second. Um, Nathan Tyson um, uh, came in to do um, add lyrics to it too. So it's this huge collaboration between us all for the last uh, uh, eight years, I suppose it is now. Wow. And you know it it has ups and its downs as we went along, and uh, you have doubts all the time, and we just kept plowing through, and now it's. Uh, Paradise Square is ready to take its place, and it'll be the first new musical to come to Broadway um, since the pandemic, which is a great thing. Well, and I can't I wait to be there uh, rooting you on. Congratulations uh, on that. Yeah, it's That's really it's, cool. I think it, I think it, uh, it catches the tenor of the times, too. Um, there's a lot of upheaval uh, in race relations and everything now. Yes. And the, the sad part of the amalgamation was that during the Civil War, um, right after, a week after the Battle of Gettysburg, before anybody totally knew that the North had won, um, there were draft riots in New York City and the people, uh, the, the rioters went after the amalgamationists and also hung 11 African-Americans. So there was a real tragedy at the end. The dance halls all closed down and it, this whole thing was forgotten about, basically by, by both sides, Irish and African-Americans. Yeah. Um, so we're bringing it back and I think one of the the lessons, if lesson is a word, is that if it happened, if these two peoples could come together back, you know, in the 1840s, two brutalized peoples, Irish escaping a famine and African Americans escaping enslavement, you know, the worst possible two things, that this can happen again. You know, the people yes. can come together. That's the, the story behind or the, the dream behind it anyway. That's, re that's a beautiful dream. It's a beautiful story. And it's something that should be in the vernacular, you know, on the tips of tongues constantly. But especially now, the timing couldn't have been better. Uh, we need to see material like this and, and we need to feel it and we need to uh empathize with it and uh absorb it and live it in our own lives um kudos to you that's great work uh, you're currently also working on a stage version of the informer tell us about that and then we'll circle back to the book too yeah, sure. there's a lot about the book but these are other cool things that people might not be aware of that you do larry the Informer, tell us about the sort of adapting that onto a stage version. Well, a guy called Bobby Moresco um, got in touch with me. He's a, he had gotten an Academy Award for Crash, that movie. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I, I had known him in bars and everything. And he wrote to me out of the blue and said, did you, did you ever see the movie The Informer or did you ever read the book by... Uh, Limo Flaherty, and as it turned out, it was my grandfather's favorite movie. That's the one with Victor McLaughlin in it. Oh yeah, sure. So, yeah. so I saw it maybe three times as a as a boy, and was really familiar with the movie. And then, when I was living in Dublin, I had read the book The Informer, but I'd forgotten all about it. And he said, "I think that." this is a great story for today uh, that a lot of people can will be able to relate to it. So would you be interested in turning it into a stage version? And I said, you know, I actually would because it was set 
1923 in Ireland, when the Civil War was uh, taking place, after Ireland got its freedom in 1921, there was a falling out between the, the people who gained freedom because some of them thought they should fight on and get the, the 32 counties uh, as part of Ireland. And other people felt, well, let's take the deal the British are giving us now. We'll just take the 26 and we'll eventually get the six counties back uh, because the British are going to move their whole army in here and the people are tired of fighting and everything. So the worst thing was a war broke out over this. And it's something that uh, the book was set in that time, but he didn't mention the Civil War uh, of Flaherty, and maybe because he thought he could get killed from it because of a lot of assassinations going on. And I had always wanted to write something about the Civil War because it's a part of Irish history that hasn't really been explored because right. there's carnage and everything every when it ended everybody wanted to put it behind them and but now it's a hundred years since it so i figured it's time to do something so uh i wanted to do it because of that also yeah. because of florida had written such a great story but it was a story for its time um the women characters weren't um, very well developed in it. And then I had to do a lot of research on O'Flaherty and uh, found out that he had been involved in the First World War and had been badly injured and was PTSD. So he had this depression all his life. So there was a, a kind of a darkness over the whole story. Um, I wanted to lighten it up just a little bit because the Irish in the in the worst of times can find humor in things. Yes. That's how we survive. The Irish yes. and the, Irish and the Jews, I find, have very similar That's funny uh, that you say that, because I've always said that they are some of the funniest, wittiest on earth. There's just an understanding of life and the human condition and the idiosyncrasies of it. And, and can spot on, see something, and immediately come up with a quick line oh, uh, right. within seconds. And I constantly do that. I'm a very, and I attribute that to the Irish side. My father's mother's family came from Ireland and settled in New York City. Uh, my father's father's side, English, they came, they settled in New York City, and they had jewelry stores in Manhattan, and they sprawled out. The Irish side went to Astoria and Bayside and spread out from there, Long Island. And my mother's side, Connecticut, Massachusetts, English, Swedish, and French. But the Irish side, definitely the quick uh, wit, always looking for the line, always looking for a way to find levity in it. And uh, I do that all the time because I'm always observing, quietly observing. And you see some of the crazy stuff that goes in, on in I front know. of you. And Actually, it's been very disarming, too, because, and I'm sure you've seen it, too, it breaks the ice. It gets people who are headstrong to melt. It gets people who just don't want to, you know, come to terms with anything or use logic, throw in a couple of funny lines, and all of a sudden, everybody's like, ah. it yeah. really, it's, uh, <laughs> and it's inherent. It's in the DNA. It's definitely in the, it's in the DNA. DNA. But the odd, the odd thing is that O'Flaherty didn't have it. He must have been the only Irish writer. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. Which stunned me because in every Irish book, there's some kind of humor. But then when I looked into his life, you know, he had a massive depression because of the PTSD. And um, yeah, yeah. so I, I took it upon myself to take some of his lines and add a little bit of um, that, that black humor because the story can be, you know, unrelenting unless there's some kind of humor in it because you're dealing with people on the, the low scale um, of the economy, but you're also dealing 
with people who are out to assassinate each other. So it's, so it's and, a mix of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be pretty gruesome. <laughs> after, unless, yeah. So that was one of the things. And the other thing was he didn't have a... He didn't seem to be able to get into the woman's head, you know, and yet there are women in there, but they tended to be, um, you know, just not fulfilled in a sense. Yeah. And, uh, but then, you know, he was writing in a different time. He was writing almost a hundred years ago and uh, it was a different time. So I, I took it upon myself to give the women characters more of a say, a more action, you know, more a part of the action of, uh, of the informer. So we, we started to have readings of it. Bobby is a great director. He's in um, Italy now doing a movie, so we're, we won't be doing anything with it until he comes back and I come back from Chicago where I'll be heading with uh, Paradise Square um, in the next month or so. Terrific. So we'll start to work on it again in December, November, December. How do you like um, hosting the popular radio show Celtic Crush on Sirius XM? I love it. Yeah. You know, uh, I was up in Sirius. Sirius had only started a couple of years at that point. And I was up doing an interview with my friend Meg Griffin. She's a pretty well-known um, radio host in oh, New York. Yeah. yeah. Remember Meg. And um, she was interviewing me about uh, about a memoir I'd written, uh, Green Suede Shoes, it's called. And Black 47 did an album called um, Green Suede Shoes at the time, too. So we talked for a long, long time about it. And then we were out in the corridor. Uh, and because we were friends and everything, we were telling stories. And she's Irish. <laughs> we were laughing. And one of the bosses happened to pass by. And he stopped, and then he called her over and said, that guy got an Irish accent. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yeah. Yes, he and, does, and it's real. <laughs> yeah, and she said, he said to her, uh, can he talk? And she said, put a couple of drinks in him. He'll never shut and him. And he'll tell you everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, well, you know, we have to. We've got so many requests for a Celtic show, but we have no one to do it. Do you think he could do it? And she came over to me and said, do you want to do it? A Celtic show up here, and I said, "Yeah, sure." I'd always wanted to. Who doesn't want to work in radio? Yeah. Uh, so she said, "Well, I'll show you. Everybody does their own thing. They, um, yeah, you, you, um, you learn how to produce your show. You do, so yeah. I'll show you how to do it. And uh, and what way do you want to do it? And I thought, well, let's go to the old FM way, you know, where you play three songs in a row, and then because <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of anything else, uh, and then the the host or the DJ would talk about the songs or bring something up. So that was the format. And then it grew from there to, you know, depending on the song, putting in politics, putting in uh, the history of Ireland, the history of Scotland. And so now it's got a really big following around the country and, and in Canada because there's, there's kind of nothing like it where, yeah. You know, I can take the time to explain something over three or four minutes or five minutes yeah. even, and then play three songs. And uh, uh, and people seem to like the, the mixture of talk and music. Yeah. I really enjoy it. And I don't prepare for very much either. I, I improv. Which is great, well, isn't it? It's great. Yeah. Yeah. I love ad-libbing and right and going with it and live yeah. and just – there's nothing, nothing like it. So that's, that's cool. You got a lot of different things that are uh, happening all at once. We also have, um, we're going to circle back to the book. And we have a little intro clip here that I want to show, which is you actually introducing the book. <laughs> it's even <laughs> the here. My COVID hair. <laughs> <laughs> my hair in a year. Mine used to be a lot shorter too, and it's a lot longer as, as, <laughs> as a result as well. Here is that clip, gang. It's about the book, Rockaway Blue. Uh, and if you came in late, you got to hear about this amazing book. And the timing of it right now is so apropos too. 
Uh, here's a little intro that Larry does for the book. Rockaway Blue is the story of two families, the Irish-American Murphys from Rockaway Beach and the Egyptian-American Ibrahims from Bay Ridge in Brooklyn. On 9-11, 2001, Lieutenant Brian Murphy gets killed in the North Tower. And about a year later, his father, Detective Sergeant Jimmy Murphy, discovers that Brian was down in the tower 30 minutes before the attack. Why? He sets out to find out why his son was there. And his trail leads him back to his old friend, Yosef Ibrahim, and to Yosef's beautiful young daughter, Fatima. Rockaway Blue is a story of redemption and is dedicated to my friends, Richie Muldowney of the NYFD and Father Michael Judge. Mm. And there's the book there. Um, you know, it's really the, the cover too speaks volumes. The cover is really, really, you know, plain, simple. It, it, you know, it says a lot in just what you're trying to portray there. Um, this really, really was a labor of love for you, this novel, wasn't it, Larry? Yeah, it was really important to me to get it right, you know, and it's been one of the joys of my life because sometimes when you, you finish something, you feel you've, you've left something out or whatever. Um, but with this one, it, it took a long time and it didn't finally click until right before I sent it in. And part of the, uh, the reason was I had got Jimmy, the father, down well. Um, and I'd finally got Brian, sort of when you read the book, even though he's not in it, you do get a picture of him. And all the other characters worked. But the one I hadn't got right was Maggie, the mother. I had her as kind of as a victim, you know? I, I had got the idea, first of all, way back, you know, 15 years ago that she was someone who was badly damaged by her son, her favorite son getting killed and not knowing how to, um, not knowing how to go on, mm -hmm. which worked in a certain way, but it made her more passive and in the book, uh, their marriage is under a huge strain and you don't know whether they're going to make it through or not. And there's another woman peripherally involved. And I realized that if Maggie is so passive, she loses this guy. And that's not what I want in the book. So I had, I put in a scene <clears throat> between the two women, between the, the wife of Jimmy and a younger woman that he's becoming more attracted to. And it's, there's, it, there's not a lot in it even, but uh, it's a great scene because the minute I got that scene right, everything clicked and was like, oh my God. Yeah, you know, there's the story. It's right. I've done it. And that was such an achievement, not, not just an achievement, but it was just a goal that I'd set out to capture this family, this family's life and how they dealt with the loss of a, of a son. And I knew that by doing that, I, that any family could read it and get what was going on in New York 
in those days after and those years after 9-11. And anybody who suffered loss of any kind probably can find bits and pieces of it and connect with it and relate with how you deal with it and with sometimes the suddenness of how it can happen too. And because sometimes we talk about it often on the show, you could have music, you could have uh, writing, you can have anything that you've created and you've had a vision and a mission that is yours. And then people take it and they interpret it and they sort of make it their own by finding little essences of it that might not exactly match the story that the creator is sharing and delivering, but resonates and clicks in certain other ways that connects them to the characters, to the storyline, to the creator, the author, the playwright, the musician, the whatever it may be. And they sort of have this relation to it. Uh, you can hear that with a piece of music. The music might be uh, thought of as a different creation than what the audience gets, but they'll, the audience will pick different things out that connect them with it, plug them into it. So with a book like this, I'm sure even for those who weren't as directly impacted by 9-11, though that, you know, really is a national, if not international situation, but where they know somebody that's gone or they know somebody that was a firefighter or somebody, I knew people that were in the tower, you know, I grew up on Long Island. So anybody in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Tri-State area or Pennsylvania or the DC area with the Pentagon, you know, direct impacts in many different ways, but still, um, there's things about it that make it unifying in certain ways and, and the way it's poignantly told. Do you see the book going beyond a book? Yeah, <clears throat> I'll definitely um, try it out as a film script, but I really see it as a musical, oddly enough. And I didn't until just recently the characters are all pretty much, um, you know, and and I say this uh, as a critic of my of my own writing is they're they're real, you know. I I can tell they're real because there are times when I would be writing it when I would start crying. It was like, oh my god, you know. Sherry uh, Larson in Kansas asks, "Is this a book we're going to need a Kleenex?" <laughs> No, it's more a book about redemption. It, it's a dry-eyed look at it. Um, there are no tears in it. Um, that doesn't mean you wouldn't uh, feel tears, but the characters, all of the characters are non-pitying. They don't pity themselves. They don't even pity too much the other people in their family. They're, it was one of the things that Chris Byrne and I set out to do with Black 47 too, that there's a tendency in Irish things to have a tears in your beer kind of thing. And I was very, we were both very aware of that. Everything we do, it can, it can stab you in the heart, but it has to be dry eyed, no false emotion. And um, so I don't think you're gonna need Kleenex, but who knows? <laughs> but have them nearby in case. <laughs> yeah. If if you're a Mets fan and you're reading it, you might. Oh, then you always need <laughs> Kleenex. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that's uh, that, that's something. Then you do cry in the beer <laughs> at the stadium. <laughs> yeah, at the stadium. Oh indeed. boy, oh boy, I tell you. Um, what's been the feedback to the book um, from, you know, those who have uh, consumed it, those, uh, you know, in the literary community or just those in general, what's been the feedback for you? It's been great. It's um, I think people are accepting it for what it is. It's, it's an account of what went on in one family and I think people like it because they can relate to the characters in it, in the family. And they're not outlandish characters. Jimmy 
is one of the favorite characters I've ever written. But he's no, he's he doesn't consider himself a hero in any sense. He's just one of those guys who feels that he has to get to the bottom of this because if he doesn't get to the bottom of it, he doesn't know his son. And his son is gone now. So he has this obligation that to his family he feels, even though, you know, Brian wasn't always the most moral type person. And what was he doing down in the tower 30 minutes before the plane crashed? He knew something that nobody else knew. And Jimmy is afraid that if he turns up something about his son that's going to run the son down, that he could send his wife back into a deep depression. So he has to make this choice. Um, should he do it or should he just walk away from it? You know, he doesn't feel like uh, he's at his best, that he, he's beginning to think that he's losing it a little bit himself, that he's he was a great detective in his day. And now he's in his late 50s and he's thinking, you know, maybe I don't have it anymore. And am I the right person even to be doing this? But at the same time, because he knows his son so well, he feels that he is the right person to do it. But he has grave doubts about himself. And I think people relate to that because when you're in a, a situation, a big situation, and you lose confidence in yourself, which we all do at some point or another, uh, Jimmy goes through that and you... Uh, you feel for him and you're kind of pushing to yeah, do it, man, do it. You know, how bad can it be? But Jimmy knows it can be bad. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's don't give up too. don't give yeah. up. Yeah. There's a lot of that. And you know, um, that's so perfect for the times we're in now where with this pandemic and the economy and the civil unrest and the political craziness and everything, there's a lot of people that have been dealing with so many things. Life has been flipped upside down and anxiety and depression are high and just things that we grew up with are no longer here. And just so many different things have happened in a really quick amount of, you know, the stuff that's happened in this year plus sometimes doesn't happen for stretches of decades all at once at the start of a new decade 2020 which is supposed to be hopeful so you know a, a message of hope a message of empathy a message of not giving up not forgetting remembering cherishing savoring is so important because a lot of people are doing that and or need to do that and they need to hear a message like that right now uh, larry yeah, and I, I think you hit you hit on don't give up. You know, I hadn't even thought about that part, but uh, as you follow Jimmy's trail through New York and uh, finding the people he thought he could depend on are letting him down, and um, but yet finding that he has to go on, uh, I think that's that's one of the central messages of the book not to give up, not to give in to depression, but to, you know, to keep on fighting. And uh, that's what we have to do with the, with the pandemic too. It's, it's, uh, we're in another time like that and uh, hopefully we're coming through it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you see uh, another book coming too? <laughs> Are you on a roll now? <laughs> no, I'm, giving, I'm giving books a break. I don't want to I'm do another one years. <laughs> I'll be down in Fort Lauderdale, stern of the water. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. No, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you never know. I never say dying. But, um, 20, I, yeah, 25 years also with uh with black 47 when uh, was it that you decided you know okay that's a good time to sort of now uh focus on some of these other things you want to continue doing in life uh, when was it that you said uh you know we did good here we did good 
Well, I was on stage in Buffalo. Uh, Black 47 was always big in Buffalo, and uh, we were playing a festival. It was a, a beautiful summer's night, and the band was on fire, and the crowd was totally into it. And I thought to myself, this is one of the best nights ever for Black 47. And at that moment, just at the same moment, uh, I thought to myself, maybe this is the time to go out because- Go out high at a high note, sort of. Yeah, also I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big boxing fan and I saw so many boxers, you know, not quit when they could have. And uh, there was just something about going out when you're on top and- Was the entire group ready for that or? No, I, I didn't even speak about it to them for about a month. Uh, Buffalo's yeah. a long way. So, but the whole next day driving back to New York, I was thinking about it. I thought it, it'll probably just go away, you know, because, you know, these things do. But it stayed in my mind and for it was there for about uh, a month. And then finally, I called all the guys and said, listen, you know, uh, and I explained what I had seen on stage and everything. And I made a suggestion. I said, we will, this was in September, um, around Labor Day, and our anniversary, our 25th anniversary would be a year and three months from then, or a year and two months. And I said, why don't we go uh, and play for the full 25 years and do a new album at the same time so that we go out with a bang and we'll be yeah. doing fresh material. And what we'll do is we'll go back to every place we played in and we'll, <clears throat> as much as possible, give um, the owners a thank you and we'll, we'll play for, you know, we won't be exorbitant. We'll uh, make it so that everybody will make some money out of this. And, and everybody thought, yeah. And that would give us a year and two or three months to make our plans to see what we would do. And then it was like a frantic uh, 14 or 15 months. And then one night in B.B. Uh, King's on 42nd Street, uh, we did our last show. And uh, it was amazing. And everyone, we walked away from it. That's B.B. King's there now, yeah. Yeah. That might be the last show there. Um, they're gone too now, B.B. King's, yeah. Gone too, yeah. We, we played there every St. Patrick's night for years, and we played there twice a year, basically. But even for the last show, everyone's saying, you should charge you know, $100 a ticket. But no, we, Black 47's thing was always to be part of the people because – our audience, a lot of them were working class and uh, lower middle class people, and we never wanted to soak money out of them. So we basically played for the same price we always played at BB King's. We we had the same admission charge, and uh, yeah, that was it. And then we walked away from it. Yeah, and I became a full time writer. I mean, I still do gigs occasionally solo gigs, but um, I'm definitely more invested in the writing at this point. Just as well, given the pandemic came in. Exactly right. Yeah. And, and you know, when you look at it, all, all, all the things you've done and continue to do, uh, there's a lot of blessing and joy in it all, isn't there? You've gotten a chance to really do a lot of things that uh, have spoken to you, have shared your story, your journey, who you are uh, through writing, through music, through performance, through various forms of the arts. Not everybody gets a chance to do that and express themselves in so many different genres, stage and, and everything else on the radio. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, in these industries, we do wear a lot of different hats, but when yeah. you get a chance to do that, we're the blessed ones. And I know you feel that way as well, don't you, Larry? Yeah. And particularly because we were pretty fierce politically. I mean, we were the band that came out against the Iraq war 
and you know lost a good portion of our following because of that because people thought we were you know being unpatriotic whereas our point was it is patriotic to go against your government if you think the government is wrong and um so th that's just one instance of it but we always did exactly what we wanted to do we never uh we never just said it took the easy way out of it uh with record companies they didn't know what to do with us a lot of the time because they didn't know what we were doing we weren't too sure what we were doing. <laughs> but we knew what it was you yeah. know and we weren't going to write songs to just get on the radio or whatever i never believed in that you just do the best you can and yeah. uh, always yeah. be trying to do the best you can absolutely sherry uh had asked she's in kansas when you guys you know wrapped up playing together was everybody in the band original? Um, four of us out of uh, five were. Um, Chris, the um, the co-founder of the band, the, the cop, he left around 2000. Uh, but we're still all great friends and everything. He didn't want to travel quite as much and he wanted to uh, explore more the hip hop Gaelic thing that he'd started off with. Uh, so. That was pretty much it. Um, yeah, four of us were the same. Now and the music, can they find it on Amazon and Spotify, oh, yeah. iTunes, and all yeah. the usual places if they want to? You know, because some of them have been sampling the music uh, as we've been chatting, uh, hearing it, and liking it, and uh, wanting to know where can we get it. So Amazon, Spotify, iTunes, all the usual places. Yeah, cool. And every, I think we did. 16 albums i kind of wow remember. yeah and the book amazon and all the usual uh places as well yeah bookstores and any online uh has it of course and then it's on kindle also if you want it oh it's on kindle as well yeah all, the way blue. all of the, all of my books are on kindle um because some of them have gone out of print now um but uh you can get rockaway blue and you can order it in any bookstore and we encourage people to um, do that because especially uh, your local bookstore or you know yeah. a chain bookstore because bookstores are they're part of the fabric of society yeah. and uh, you right. gotta keep going yeah. gotta keep gotta keep supporting uh -huh. local as much as you can absolutely exactly Larry, this was awesome. This was really fantastic. Touched upon a lot of different cool things. And there was somebody here that uh, who was known for a lot of levity, who's sort of my sidekick. And uh, he just wanted to express what an awesome evening he had as well. Uh, George Burns was with us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Good old George. Good old George. George and Grace. And Grace. <laughs> I tell, whenever I show this, it's like all the guests, like, I love it. I love <laughs> Talk it. about levity, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think I've got the same glasses. Wait, I was going to say, you look a little bit like George in a way. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you got the cigar too? Or, uh, <laughs> I, never, I never got I You never did the cigar thing. Oh, I did, but I uh, threw <laughs> up a few times after him. <laughs> yeah. Cigars said, and you are made to be together. Yeah. He sends his best and he enjoyed yeah, himself yeah. tonight. And thanks, <laughs> thanks to all your levities. I, oh, I can yeah. use some of the comments. The coming comments in. coming in and yeah. Yeah, we're very interactive with this show. And uh, it's yeah. been a blessing doing uh, this Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show series along the way. I hope uh, you enjoyed your time with me and the show. Oh, yeah. Whatever expectations definitely. that you had as well, Larry. Yes, definitely. It was a, it's a great chat. And uh yeah, you're you're a wonderful host. So I, I can see why you're so successful at it. I appreciate that. I want, I want to show you uh, Alessandra in North Carolina says the stories are wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, the stories that you just shared with us about your life. Kathleen in New York City. Thank Kathleen, you for being Kathleen here with us. The Met. Kathleen, Kathleen yeah, with, the geez, Met. with the Mets. Yeah. Black 47 played Shea Stadium more than the Beatles. <laughs> really now there's uh wow we, kathleen did you know that wow i think we did four irish nights there we started the irish nights at 
at um now did you uh when shea was going to come down for city field like billy joel was there at the end were you playing close to the end of shea as well no uh but we did do a final gig in city field in city field yeah oh uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Well, we were breaking up that's well, September, I think it was. Yeah. September. Um, 2014. Yeah. I'm a Mets fan. Yeah, that's it. with them. <laughs> uh, Ann in uh, Florida says, looking forward to reading Rockaway Blue, especially as we're approaching the 20th anniversary of the horrific event. Thank you for sharing the evening with us and good night. Um, it's hard to believe 20 years. Absolutely. Really, really is. Uh, yeah. Sherry in Kansas says, uh, Thank you, Larry. Your book sounds like a must read. Merlin in Ontario, Canada says, love fire for freedom. Oh, that's, that's a Black 47 album. Thanks, Merlin. Yeah. Uh, Mary Bishop in Florida says, great conversation, Larry. Take care. Uh, Kathleen, once again, thank you for being here. We're here with us, Larry. Great show. Um, Dawn says, God bless you, Larry. Uh, glad that you were here. Uh, Kathleen, when you had mentioned that, uh, Black 47 played more than the Beatles at Shea. She goes, oh, wow, cool. And uh, Alessandra says, big lovety hug. Cool stuff. Um, you're great, Larry. You're great to chat with. And I feel like, you know, we're, we're at a pub, uh, just relaxing. And that's the kind of conversational freestyle warm atmosphere I like to do. Like the uh, old school TV presenters and hosts that yeah. we all look up to with a modern vibe, modern twist of today. And uh, we will definitely keep the porch light on for you and welcome you back anytime. And hopefully with our friend Anita, maybe we'll uh, gather, break bread. That would be really cool yeah, in the city. I'd love to do that. Or uh, uh, in the constitution state as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Christine says, Larry, thanks. She's in North Carolina. Thanks for sharing so many life stories. Many of them so fascinating. It was great learning more of your career. Your book looks fantastic and so relevant. You are a true lovity. It all comes back to lovity, huh? Yeah. It all comes back to lovity. I'm right. <laughs> you, you can't, you can't go wrong with lovity, my friend. Well, I, what I'll do is I'll come back uh, when the show is about to go to Broadway and we can, we can have a real talk about Paradise Square. This show or yours? <laughs> or both? <laughs> So. <laughs> yeah, you'll be going to Broadway and we'll be going uh, to network. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> that'll, that'll be a great celebration. Uh, right. You're the best, Larry. And um, that's really, oh, you know, this is when you hear stuff like this, that's cool. Alessandra says, I got inspired oh. from the conversation tonight. Now inspired to go back to writing poems. Say, you know, you never that's know whose point. lives you touch, right? Through. <clears throat> Through That's the work good. that you do and the work that you love. Thanks for being with us, my friend, uh, and all the time that you spent with us. Now, I say to all the guests, go stretch those legs and get the circulation going. Yeah. <laughs> get, get a beer going, too. Get a beer going, too. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> That's it. All right. Well, sure. You have a good night and good luck with the book and the plays and everything else that you got. You got a lot of balls in the air and you seem to be juggling them quite well and much continued success and blessing to you, Larry, and to your family and everybody. And we'll see you soon, I'm sure. Thanks, Jim. Take care Bye. of yourself, man. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye now. Larry Kerwin, live and direct from New York City. We hope you guys enjoyed it here on the Gym Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. Got a chance to learn a little bit more about uh, Black 47 and his incredible new book, which again, you can find at the bookstores, you can find online, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and even Kindle, he mentioned as well. There it is, Rockaway Blue, Larry Curran, a novel. Kind of cool, you know, if you knew him just from the band, from uh, Black 47, and you might not have known about all these other things. He wrote five other books. He's written 17 plays and musicals. Uh, he's doing a stage play of The Informer. Um, you know, everything else that he's got going on, which is absolutely incredible. He uh, does Celtic Crush, the very popular radio show on Sirius XM Radio. He writes a column for the Irish Echo paper, um, which is really incredible. So Rockaway Blue has been described by um, 
others as a big, fiery Irish-American masterpiece, a spellbinding story with characters that come to life with every turn of the page. That is the kind of feedback that this book is getting. Novel written by Larry Kerwin. And again, a really, really cool one to add to your reading collection. Cool stuff. Great guy with a real true Irish spirit. And uh, here he is here over the years as well. And again, this is with Black 47. This was another night and the gang. And this was the final at B.B. King's in New York City, which was a great place. No longer around B.B. King's, but that was a great place as well. Cool stuff. Uh, boy, do we have an amazing guest tomorrow night. In two seconds, I'll tell you who it is. Somebody that's actually acting right now with Morgan Freeman, the legendary actor. Sherry Larson says, thank you, Jim. What an interesting man. Everyone have a wonderful evening and night. Good night, all. You as well. You as well in Kansas. And uh, Alessandra says, after this show is over, going back to learning more Gaelic. <laughs> so you're writing poems and you're learning more Gaelic. That is cool. And Jane in Sweden, still up with us. We love Jane as well. One of our lovities. She says, thanks, Larry, for visiting us. Cool stuff. You guys are the best. And uh, want to let you know that uh, tomorrow night, got another amazing guest. We have a week filled with extraordinary guests. Uh, Coming up here just for you, Brian Kurlander's with us. He was in House of Cards, Hot Summer Nights, Star. He's working right now with uh, Morgan Freeman. He's going to be my special guest on the Jim Masters Show Live. That's at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, and it's going to be quite cool. We're looking forward to it. Then... Coming up on Wednesday, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, we're going to talk relationships. We're going to talk marriage and dating and families and friends and coworkers and so much more, life in general, and how to get through it all in our relationships with relationship expert, licensed marriage and family therapist and psychotherapist, the renowned Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, live and direct from Los Angeles. That's going to be a really, I know you love when we do uh, these kinds of shows as well. That's part of our lifestyle segment of our entertainment lifestyle talk show. Sometimes it's talk, sometimes it's our lifestyle segments, sometimes it's entertainment. That's why we call it a real cool variety show. And it really is coming up on Thursday. Another great one. There's a fabulous new, very touching and moving uh, Christmas film coming out called Rekindling Christmas. And we have the Emmy nominated executive producers of this. I know you guys love Christmas and you love, you know, a lot of the Hallmark movies since that nature. This is a beautiful one. She is Rebecca is an extraordinary renowned best-selling novelist, and this is based on one of her stories. She's also a prolific writer and much, much more. And her husband is James. He's a renowned director, producer, and so much more. Uh, they teamed up to present this amazing Emmy-nominated film, Rekindling Christmas. And we're going to be welcoming both to the show this coming Thursday. It's going to be amazing. Friday, pop and country music singer and musician Samantha Taylor is going to be with us for some music, some chat, some inspiration, and lots of surprises right here on JMS Live for all of you. And that is just some, some of the guests. That's right. Just some of the guests that are coming up right here for you on the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. We love having all of these shows for all of you, and uh, it's always a blessing to, to do this for you guys. Don't forget to smile, and uh, don't forget to share the lovity, <laughs> and don't forget to find your Zen place. We were at the coast today. Uh, check out our new Master's Mantra video on Gym Master's TV, The Wall of Wow. Uh, Incredible, really, really beautiful thing we came upon and we captured it for our master's mantras, verbal and visual inspirational, short inspirational video series. That's you can find the master's mantras series here on our YouTube channel, which is Jim Masters TV. Uh, so we were at the coast today, really beautiful. And um, 
this isn't today, this photo, of course, but find your Zen place. Mine is with loving family and friends, as well as cycling, tennis, music, writing, uh, gardening, sports, all of it. Good times, good conversation, and the ocean. Swimming, surfing, boogie boarding, sailing it, floating in it. I love the ocean. And, of course, my work in television, radio, stage, and film over the years. That is also a Zen place for me. And uh, Larry Kerwin, our guest, has lots of Zen places, as you can see as well. He's got his hands in a lot of different cool things. You're watching the Gym Masters Show live right here on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, which truly is a channel dedicated to entertaining and inspiring, informing, educating, and lots more with a lot of levity and a lot of... Uh, interaction with all of you as well. If you haven't subscribed, we would love it if you did and click the notification bell so you never miss any of our fantastic episodes. Uh, we've done 440 shows and they've been truly amazing. We're still going strong. We're just still getting started. 440 episodes and we're still just getting started. We thank Larry for joining us again, uh, founder, co-founder of the Celtic Rock Band. Celtic rock band, but also a lot more as you learn tonight, not just Celtic, but rock and reggae and <laughs> a whole punk. I mean, a lot of different things as they were figuring it out. An author of, again, Rockaway Blue. Check that book out. It really is a cool one. And uh, thank you, Kathleen. Kathleen, that's our super stickers. She did super emojis. Look at all those cool emojis. That really helps support our show and all of the investment in the show and the technology and the production and the equipment and the hours and the time and the booking and the, whew, it's like a full-time job, even though I have a full-time job in television and radio in the daytime. <laughs> Thanks, Kathleen. You're the best. So uh, we do have during our live chat, we have super emojis, uh, it comes up in a very special color like that. Super stickers, super chat, super emojis. That's what it looks like. And when we see it, we always highlight it. I personally thank the folks that do that. You're the best, Kathleen. You've done it several times, and that means a great deal. You go the extra mile, Kathleen, always. And thank you so very, very much. So that is available when the show is live in the upper tier of the chat section of comments. Now, if you still want to do something like that, but the show isn't live, there's a new button that is on our episodes of the Gym Master Show Live that when the show is not on, but the episode is archived, you can see it, it has a little heart and it says super thanks. So what you're doing there is you're basically saying thanks to us for doing what we do with the Gym Masters Show live series. And that means that, uh, you know, obviously the show is speaking to you and you really enjoy it. So you can still do that kind of thing even when the chat isn't happening. That is when the show is over. The super emojis, super chat, um, super stickers, that's when the show is live. But the super thanks, which is the little heart icon, which is next to the thumbs up like on the actual episode video. You can do that when the show is uh, over and when it's archived. That's a new thing. I guess we reached a milestone again here on YouTube and they're giving us these opportunities to offer these cool things to our viewers. Uh, we really appreciate that. Thank you, Kathleen. She did the super emojis. And also don't forget to give uh, a thumbs up like on the actual YouTube episode on our YouTube channel. That helps us big time. We see that. We thank you. YouTube sees it. They take the episode and they blast it out to more people. So more people can enjoy what you're enjoying. Uh, Kathleen also says, have a great night, Jim. Looking forward to a great week of shows. Good night, all, and hugs. You too as well, Kathleen. Mona in Louisiana. Thank you for another great show. Good night, Jim and Lovities. Hugs to all you as well, Mona. Alessandra says, night, all. See y'all tomorrow. We will see you as well. Jim, thanks for a wonderful show with Larry. Really enjoyable conversation. Good night, Jim. Until next time, lovely hugs. Right back at you, Christine in North Carolina. Jane in Sweden. Uh, and we love Jane. She, you know, it's late at night for her, or it's tomorrow already, and she's still with us. Um, and we love it. Good night, lovely Jim and all the loveties with the Irish uh, green hearts. Thank you very much. If you didn't see the show on Saturday, we had two shows. We had a surprise pop-up show, which was awesome. A lot of people have been watching that. And then our very special guest, uh, singer and songwriter, an actress, Ella Roberts, was with us live from Australia. 
she's a dear friend and it was epic. We had a lot of music on that show and that was really cool. So check that out if you didn't see it and, um, good stuff. Good stuff. If you do miss any of our shows live, don't fret because we do archive them. You can watch them on your televisions. If your television gets YouTube, your cable company or your service provider gets uh, YouTube, we have Xfinity Comcast. We get YouTube on our televisions so we can watch this series. You can watch the Gym Master Show live on television. You can watch it on your tablet, your computer. Some people watch it on their game consoles. Some people watch it on their uh, laptops. Uh, but the number one way people are watching this series, believe it or not, on their mobile phones, on their cell phones, which I think is really, really cool. So you can really take us with us, take us with you, take you with us, us with you. You know how it works. We can all be together on your cell phone. You can watch the past episodes, you know, when you're on a train or when you're on top of a mountain or <laughs> wherever you are. And of course, you can watch us live as well on your cell phone. So um, you don't have to be really plugged in anywhere. The Gym Masters Show Live on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, is available on your mobile phone, on your computer, your laptop, your tablet, your television, if your provider offers that uh, YouTube on your television. And even on game consoles, we have folks watching us on their game consoles, Xboxes and everything else. I think that's really, really cool. Um, so glad to be here. We miss you when you're not, when you're working as well, but you always see us in the archives. And Alessandra says, oh, I need to talk to Dr. Annabelle Bugatti. She'll be here this week as well. And uh, Good night, everybody. You guys are the best. Thanks for joining us in this episode of the Gym Master Show Live. Once again, we thank our very special guest, Larry Kerwin. And we always thank all of you for joining us here on the show. You guys are the very, very best. We'll check you out. We'll be here tomorrow live. Special guests, uh, Brian Kurlander from House of Cards and much, much more. Uh, he's going to be with us. He's all excited. And we look forward to it. It's going to be an amazing show tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. And uh, again, you can see over 440 episodes of our series on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, archived, and also our Masters Mantras Inspirational Short Video Series is also on Gym Masters TV. And we're actually working on a third series too. Uh, so stick with us. Much more coming up for all of you. We love to entertain. We love to have a good time on JMS. All right, guys. I think I'm done talking. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the air earlier today, so it's been a busy day and we were at the coast and all the rest. Love you all. Thanks for being with us on the Gym Master Show Live. Uh, we're working hard behind the scenes here. As you can see, we've made uh, a few upgrades and some tweaking and some visual um, tweaking and fine tuning and enhancements. And we're just getting started with all that for uh, your pleasure and your enjoyment, gang. We'll see you tomorrow. We love you all and have a good night. Bye-bye.